Hello, it's Dr. Kevin Kirby. Come to you today. Again, we're going to be discussing biomechanics terminology for the modern podiatrist. And today's discussion is going to be on the important subject of translational and rotational equilibrium. When we start to talk about equilibrium, we have to first just review this concept of forces and moments. Remember that force is a linear vector quantity that both has magnitude, line of action, point of application, and direction. This, here we have the force, moment arm, line of action, and direction toward the mechanic here. Rotational force, though, is known as a moment, uh, short for moments of force. It's also known as torque. The equation for moments is moments equals force times moment arm with moment arm being the perpendicular distance from the line of action force to that moment arm. When we start talking about equilibrium though, that's very important when we start talking about the internal forces experienced by the tissues within the foot and lower extremity during weight bearing activities. So this concept of equilibrium needs to be reviewed so we all understand uh, what it means. So equilibrium means when all forces acting on an object are exactly counterbalanced. And this is based on Newton's second law of motion, F equals MA, where force equals mass times acceleration. So when the acceleration of the object is zero, then the force acting on the object, the summation of forces, will also be zero. So here we see in this ball resting on the ground, when the upwards force from ground reaction force acting on the ball with the gravitational acceleration on its mass pulling downward to equal and opposite forces, then we can say it's, it's going to be at rest, and we can say it's in static equilibrium. It's not moving uh, at, at all, so its velocity would be constant at zero. So translational equilibrium means that the object is either at rest or moving from side to side or back and forth in a linear path at a constant velocity. A rotational equilibrium means that the moments on either side of the axis of rotation are going to be exactly equal. So the, in this situation where we have a, a little girl and a little boy on two sides of a seesaw, the downward force from the little girl creating a counterclockwise moment must be exactly equal to the clockwise moment from the downward force from the little boy being pulled down by gravity. When those two moments, the clockwise moment and the counterclockwise moments are exactly equal, that is when we can say it's in a rotational equilibrium. And that's the only time that seesaw is going to be resting in a perfectly level position when those two sides of the seesaw axis are, in, uh, are equal to each other in moments and therefore in rotational equilibrium. So the rotational equilibrium of a seesaw is important because it's very easy to describe these concepts of masses and moment arms causing moments and rotational equilibrium. In this case, we have a seesaw with a 200 Newton mass on the right side, a 200 Newton mass on the left side at a three meter distance on each moment arm, producing a 600 Newton meter clockwise moment on the right, a 600 Newton meter counterclockwise moment on the left, meaning that these two moments on opposite and equal moments are producing a situation of rotational equilibrium where in this situation the seesaw board is perfectly level not moving. So the counterbalancing of these two masses along with their moment arms is producing this situation of rotational equilibrium. However when we have unbalanced moments this is what causes this angular acceleration at this axis of rotation in this case the seesaw. Here we've lengthened the moment arm on the right to four meters. On the left, we've shortened it to only two meters and we've done basically just shifted this axis of rotation, the fulcrum one meter to the left. And now we have a much greater clockwise moment on the right, a much lesser counterclockwise moment on the left. And this produces an unbalancing of moments, which is gonna cause an angular acceleration of the seesaw in the clockwise direction. And once it rotates downward, it will finally hit the ground, and then it will achieve another situation of rotational equilibrium or static equilibrium, where now ground reaction force is pushing upwards on the right-hand side of the board to create the additional 
counterclockwise moments that are necessary to produce this situation of rotational equilibrium. And you can use these distances and forces uh, to calculate the ground reaction force that would be necessary. And this is actually not a very difficult equation to perform once you understand uh, the concepts. But the bottom line is we need to understand that this situation of rotational equilibrium is important uh, to understanding the forces acting on and within the joints of the body. So let's look at the elbow joint. Uh, when we are uh, holding a barbell statically with our arm flexed to approximately 90 degrees, we have a situation where the biceps and uh, elbow joint flexor forces is pulling on the uh, lower arm to produce a flexion moment. The barbell is being accelerated by gravity. Its mass is being accelerated by gravity to produce a force downward. And its force component that is directly perpendicular to the axis of the uh, forearm is going to be causing an extension moment. And until that moment, extension moment at the elbow is exactly equal to the flexion moment of the elbow, then this weightlifter will be able to hold the barbell in a perfectly still position in a position of rotational equilibrium. Also during standing, we can use another example of rotational equilibrium. During bipedal standing, our central nervous system actually calculates exactly how much plantar flexion force is needed by the ankle joint plantar flexors, such as the gastrocnemius sosilis complex, which is attached to the Achilles tendon, on the posterior aspect of the calcaneus, producing an internal ankle joint plantar flexion moment. These muscles are gonna to need to be active to resist the uh, force caused by gravitation acting on the center mass, accelerating the center mass downward, which then will cause the ground reaction force, which is anterior to the ankle joint, to cause an ankle joint dorsiflexion moment. So the gastrocnemius soleus causes an actual ankle joint plantar flexion moment, which is an internal force, whereas the ground reaction force on the ankle joint with its point of application being in the forefoot area, causing an ankle joint dorsiflexion moment, which is an external moment, these two moments must be equal in order for the person to maintain balance and not to fall either forward on his face or backwards on his back. So this is another way we can use this concept of rotational equilibrium to understand some of our daily activities and the forces required by the body and, the, and also understand the actions that the central nervous system goes through to perform these activities. When you start looking more specifically at the subtilar joint axis, which has been a area of interest for me for the past uh, 30, over 30 years, we can see that when this uh, axis of the subtilar joint goes medial or lateral, here's from the dorsal aspect, here's a normal axis location passing out through the posterior lateral aspect of the calcaneus and overlying the first metatarsal anteriorly, but more medial axis location, lateral axis location here on the dorsal view of the foot. Then on the plantar view of the foot, again, we have the medial axis, the normal axis, and the lateral axis. We can some, just imagine how changes in the subtalar joint, the subtalar joint axis locations can lead to variations in the amount of moments that are going to be experienced by the subtalar joint during weight bearing activities, uh, either from ground reaction force or muscle activity. So when we look at ground reaction force acting on the plantar foot in a normal axis location, any ground reaction force lateral to the axis is going to be causing a subtalar joint pronation moment. And any ground reaction force medial to the axis is going to cause a subtilar joint supination moment. So that in a foot that functions most normally, and here's a foot that functions very normally during gait, you will see approximately equal halves of the foot being on the supination side and another equal half of the foot being on the pronation side. So that when we have a ground reaction force both medial to the axis causing a supination moment and ground reaction force on the lateral aspect of the foot causing pronation moment. When these two moments are balanced, then normal gait function is more likely to occur. 
Muscle force is also affected by subterranean axis location. If we have the medial muscles here, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, uh, Achilles tendon, and gastrocnemius psoas complex, these muscles being at a certain distance medial to the subterranean axis, when they have a tension uh, in the tendons, this will cause a subtelogenic supination movement, but the perineus brevis extension to the term longus and perineus tertius, and also possibly the perineus longus acting lateral to the axis will cause a subtelogenic pron uh, pronation movement. And these are all internal moments since they act internally within the body. And when we have a subtelogenic axis location that's either medial or lateral, we can see how the changes in these muscle moment arms that occur from the change in Taylor head and the neck position relative to the rest of the foot. Uh, and since the uh, subtelogenic axis location moves with the Taylor head and neck, when we have these changes in Taylor head and neck position due to either a medial axis where the talus has rotated medially or the talus has rotated laterally, causing a laterally deviated axis, this changes uh, the muscle moment arms and also the moments coming from the extrinsic muscles of the foot on the subtelogenic axis. We can also use this idea of equilibrium to determine the internal loads in the foot and lower extremity skeleton. Uh, here we have a diagram of a foot on a table. And again, we have a force underneath the forefoot. We have the Achilles tendon force here, and we have the ankle joint compression force. And when we start to look at this uh, diagram, we start to get into what we call a free body diagram. So that when we start thinking about translational equilibrium, that means that if this foot is still, all the forces acting uh, on the right-hand side going toward the left are gonna be pushing the uh, foot uh, toward the left-hand side of the picture. And all the forces that are going from the left to the right are gonna be pushing the foot to the right. So in order for this foot to remain in equilibrium, uh, the forces pushing the foot to the left, including the uh, force underneath the plantar forefoot from our hand and from the Achilles tendon resisting that force have to equal this ankle joint compression force coming from the tibia acting on the foot or otherwise the foot will accelerate either uh, to the left or right. And here we have this free body diagram. I was talking about free body diagrams are used within engineering and biomechanics often in order to describe the, all the forces uh, acting on a uh, uh, object or a body part in order to try to uh, determine the loads acting on them, internal loads specifically, which are hard to measure. So the rotational equilibrium can be, uh, along with the translational equilibrium can be used in order to determine the exact ankle joint loads and Achilles tendon loads if we knew that these distances, 10 centimeters, five centimeters that I have put into this diagram to give you an example of how we can use just the force acting on the a plantar forefoot, if we have a knowledge of that, then we can determine the Achilles tendon force and the approximate ankle joint compression force simply by using these concepts of rotational equilibrium and translational equilibrium to produce this free body diagram. This is, becomes useful when we start looking at uh, things such as ankle joint implants, uh, is that these ankle joint implants are trying to be designed to avoid ankle joint fusions, the problem with these ankle joint implants is that they are subjected to large, very large loads. Uh, when we have the, this diagram here of a foot uh, going up into heel off, we have a strong force from Achilles tendon at approximately two times ground reaction force. We have the force coming up from the ground and push off on the person's body weight. And the combination of this ground reaction force plus the Achilles tendon force are gonna add up to meaning that the ankle joint is gonna to need to have uh, three times body weight or three times ground reaction force on this ankle joint implant, which are used. So for a, someone who weighs 200 pounds, this is gonna be a 600 pound force acting on the implant with each step, which is a huge amount of force uh, for an ankle implant to be able to resist uh, and not push through the bone, uh, you know, either through the tibia component of the uh, ankle implant or the tater component of the implant. So this is another example of how we can use this concept of rotational and translational equilibrium to determine some of the internal loads acting not only through the joints, but also through the muscles that govern the actions and uh, motions of the foot and lower extremity. 
So in summary, uh, equilibrium can either be a translational equilibrium or it can be a rotational equilibrium. We must also remember the rotational equilibrium can only occur when the moments on one side are equal to moments on the other side of the axis so that when the, we see the joint at rest or we see the joint axis rotating at constant velocity, then that means that it is in rotational equilibrium. Static equilibrium where the rotation velocity is zero is very useful for us to determine internal loads on joints and on the muscles and tendons during static activities. And this concept of rotational equilibrium uh, is very useful for us uh, when we look at the subtalar joint in determining how uh, the subtalar joint moments, whether they're pronation moments or supination moments, are produced by these changes in subtalar joint oxidation, which can also help us understand the forces acting on the tendons and ligaments that resist these motions during our weight bearing activities. So I hope this review of translational and rotational equilibrium has been of uh, help for you. And uh, I'm hoping that these short videos on these important uh, biomechanics terminology concepts is uh, helping you understand the biomechanics of the foot and lower extremity better. Thank you for your attention.